So, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you to the organizers for bringing me up. Um, I, most of my talk today is going to focus on the capacitor technology itself, digging into some more detail about how we designed it and how we manufacture it. Before I get into that, I want to give an overview of Medtronic and um, what, why it's of interest to, to this conference. Medtronic is a medical device company, um, 17 billion in sales today, 50,000 people worldwide. When it started, it was the invention of one person, uh, a, a graduate student at the university, and in his spare time as he was becoming an engineer, he went to the local hospital and made money by repairing equipment there. One day, uh, Dr. Lillehei came to Earl Bakken and said uh, he'd, had a, he'd had a fatality. At that time, pacemakers were large objects that plugged into the wall. He'd had a child uh, using such a device. There'd been a power failure, and his patient had died. So he asked Earl to put together a pacemaker that would be battery powered and would not be affected by the next power failure. So Earl went, found a popular mechanics magazine, and used the circuitry for a metronome to make the first external battery-powered pacemaker, and put it together that evening, brought it in. Uh, today, the FDA would have you check that over for months. Back in that day, uh, they just started using it. And the next day, his, the Medtronic's first uh, device was in use. Medtronic uh, uh, electrical stimulation is still the biggest part of our, of our work. It turns out, whoops, um, uh, we, we focus a lot on the heart, because heart, heart problems can be fatal, but stimulating the brain, uh, the bladder, the spine for pain, all of those are effective therapies now. And we're continuing to look into other, other things like dystonia, obesity, as time goes on. Medtronic works in non-communicable diseases. These are a, a, a global problem. Uh, it's the leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, about two-thirds of people died of non-communicable diseases who died in 2008. And um, it, it's a leading source of health care spending. And uh, globally, it's a serious problem. 80% um, of people dying are in low to middle income economies where there aren't the resources to provide treatment. And aside from being a personal tragedy for those people and their families, it's a serious economic problem because it tends to kill people while they're in their productive years. Um, and so it's about a $30 trillion output loss expected by 2030. Over most of the course of Medtronic's existence, we haven't been very good at delivering uh, solutions that would be able to be used in the lower and middle income economies. Um, we've really had our hands full to take, for instance, the pacemaker from um, something that was outside the body with leads to something that was implanted, and finally something that's small enough to be deployed pectorally without really bothering arm motion and really not bothering the patient too much with leads that can be put in as an outpatient procedure. Um, so this, the, in this case, the, the technology is mature enough that the next steps we're looking at that are in development now uh, to shrink the pacemaker still further. The, we're calling this the micro. It's in development, so uh, to a certain extent, we can project what we want onto it, maybe it will work, maybe it won't. But um, it's small enough to be entirely contained in the heart, so there are no leads. That takes some cost out. The delivery mechanism is simpler and shouldn't require uh, highly trained specialists. And so that's taking some cost out. And so we're hoping that the mature phase of the pacemaker may be, may be something that can be more globally available than our products have been so far. 
Um, just as a quick aside, Medtronic has also been taking a stronger interest in uh, directly looking at the, um, you know, third world uh, developing countries and thinking about what, what is in the way of us providing services directly. In 2010, we started doing fellowships. We went abroad and started um, looking at what we could do. We started a pilot program in India. Whether we, in, in remote villages, it can be very difficult to get to hospitals. But um, with this pilot program, we set up camps, had locally trained, uh, you know, low-tech uh, sorts of uh, training required to have people provide health care in these camps right in the villages. You can take an electrocardiogram and wirelessly send it to the hospitals that are involved and uh, centralize the evaluation, but provide care where the hospitals don't reach very well. Um, and in 2013, that spread to 70 hospitals, and about 12,000 people have been screened. About 200 have needed loans, which we've been able to locally source uh, for more aggressive therapies, implants. And as of, as of now, None of those loans have defaulted. OK. So more back, back to the main part of the talk. I've talked about a pacemaker. A pacemaker just needs to kind of tap the heart, just give it a, a little bitty pulse of electricity to remind the sinus node to start things going. A defibrillator is needed when, when the heart, the different parts of the heart are not electrically synchronous. And so uh, it's just sort of electrical noise. It's not effectively beating. And once, once blood flow has stopped, uh, people generally become unconscious in about 15 seconds. And uh, brain damage can start in about six minutes. So there's not a lot of time for somebody to find uh, treatment externally. So, we made this implantable pacemaker to constantly monitor the heart for people where, where we know this is a problem. And if therapy is needed, we charge a capacitor and provide a much larger joule of 30 to 40 joules. Uh, actually, most people only need about 10, but there's a lot of variation. So you need to design the capacitor to be able to deliver about 30 or 40 joules to make sure anybody getting the device, uh, the, the therapy would be effective. Um, this, this isn't as mature in the sense of it, it uh, translating to a global population. In the very beginning, the devices were so large that they had to be implanted in the abdomen. And to make contact to the heart, you did open heart surgery and actually sewed on electrode patches. Um, after a few years, the size went down and it was possible to take leads up as you do for pacemakers and intravenously or intravascularly uh, send the leads directly into the heart internally, which is something you can do with an, you know, with, without very much surgery, just, just a small incision. And then over the last 10 years or so, um, we've, we've gotten them small enough. They're not as small as pacemakers. They're kind of about the size of a pack of cards. Um, but they can be put in pectorally, which is better. But they're still not quite small enough. There's, still, there's a little bit of interference with arm motion. And so it's, it's not as good as a pacemaker yet. There is one step in the direction of a more, more readily available approach. Um, subcutaneous ICDs have been brought to the market by Cameron Health. And there the idea is there will be no lead to the heart at all. The leads would be right under the skin. And so you wouldn't need to involve an optophysiologist. So there's, there's half a step towards something that would be more readily available. So the technology that, that I'm going to talk about that supports this device is the capacitor. Of course, a capacitor is just the dielectric with charge on each side. And um, more area, thinner dielectric is more capacitance. Um, Energy is one half CV squared. We designed for energy, so that's what we're after. 
We need the capacity to deliver, uh, deliver as Joe quite abruptly. The heart beats a couple times a minute, and there's electrical, oops. There's electrical activity within that beat. So it turns out you want to deliver within about 10 milliseconds to really uh, be therapeutic and not dampening. Um, if you want, that's the, that, that means you need an IC time constant of around five milliseconds. Since, since the heart itself has an impedance of about 50 ohms, that means the capacity is going to be about 100 microfarads. And to get the energy that puts you in the range of about 800 volts. In practice, people have gone as low as 600 and as high as 900. Uh, tissue damage becomes possible if you go much higher than that. Um, there are a couple technologies that are worth, that we, that we follow at least. Polymer film capacitors are just a stretch membrane for the dielectric. They work well at a couple thousand volts. They're actually used in the external defibrillators you see in airports. But at 800 volts, it's difficult to make them thin enough to make them efficient, and they end up being quite large. Ceramics have, have the promise of high energy density, uh, but they're quite heavy, and uh, they, they, they haven't paid off in energy density as well as, as what we're using. And to my knowledge, nobody has used them to, to date. A more recent entry is double layer capacitors. They have an appealing energy density. They're basically a high surface area of carbon and an electrolyte. Uh, but so far, their internal resistance is so high that their time constant is about a second, and so they're not suitable for us. What ends up working is electrolytic capacitors. They have suitable energy density. They were uh, uh, readily available at the time we started this, this business. And so, so that's pretty much what everybody uses. So that's basically a capacitor where one side is a metal, the dielectric is the oxide of that metal. You grow directly on the substrate. And then you use a liquid electrolyte on the other side. Using that liquid allows you to fully access uh, the surface area of, a, high, of a, you know, a highly porous object that you could use. Uh, basically, the two things that, that end up being useful are aluminum can be etched. And you can get a, a, a highly porous substrate you can grow oxide to operate about 400 volts. You can have two capacitors in series. Tannin has the advantage that you can start easily with a powder. You can build up a very thick substrate, and it's a very open, uh, very open porosity. And of course, this is just half of the capacitor. Uh, since it's ionic conduction on one side, you need another electrode to get us back to uh, electronic induction for the rest of the device. Um, and this, this capacitor, this cathode capacitor, uh, just needs to be high, high surface area, high, high capacity so it doesn't get in the way. Um, and this, we, we use two layers of separators so that pinholes won't uh, allow, the, allow contact between the electrodes. Once you've grown your oxide to the, the thickness you want, it's proportional to voltage. Um, you need to think about what, what voltage you can operate at. Um, there are, you know, there should be two main contributors to, to leakage current. At low field, uh, electrons will hop from local site to local site, assisted by, you know, KT and the field you're applying. And that leakage should be proportional to the square root of the field. At high field, the ionic transport that allowed you to grow the oxide in the first place takes over. So one of my colleagues, John Norton, did some careful work making sure that that really is what's happening with our capacitors. And sure enough, at low fields, um, we, we have a nice square root dependence. And at high fields, um, ionic dependence. And so we have a good sense of what leakage our devices are going to give us um, um, normalized by capacitance, since um, it's, it's going to matter how big the device is. 
This has two consequences that are important for the design. The first is that no matter how far down, no matter how far down you go, the leakage is still high compared to what you would need to keep the device charged. This therapy might not happen for months. And so if you kept the capacitor charged and ready, the leakage would drain your battery pretty quickly. That's unfortunate. Um, you've only got, since, you, since you've only got 14 seconds before you want to operate, that means you need a circuit and a high rate battery that can charge it. Uh, but it turns out that pretty much everybody's been able to do that without, without too much trouble. So it's not, it's not a serious problem. It's a minor disappointment. Now, if you were designing a device for thousands, hundreds of thousands of uses, you would want to derate this quite a bit. If you operate up in this range, ion motion is happening in your dielectric, your system is not really quite stable. It's changing over time. Um, so most people operate at 50% derating or, or more. And uh, this is a case where our application makes things easier for us. Since the device spends, you know, certainly no more than five minutes at voltage, the battery uh, wouldn't last if it did more than that. And most, most people only need a couple therapies over the, over the life of the device. So the battery is really only capable of delivering 150. So we can operate at a pretty high voltage uh, and not be affected by ionic motion changes over the life of the device. That really allows us to increase the energy density quite a bit just by pushing that voltage up. So um, this, is, this is pictures of implantable uh, defibrillators made by Medtronic since the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm showing our pictures because I had not ready access to them. Our competitors uh, have made similar products that have similar constraints. In the beginning, we used cylindrical, capac cylindrical aluminum capacitors. They were photo flash caps back in the days before cell phones. These were ubiquitous. They were made in high, high speed production. Um, they were pretty cheap. And so to get them in the market quickly, they were a very good choice. But the diameter of the, of the capacitor depend, determines the thickness of your device. That made it quite thick. They're difficult to package around. And so the first thing we did was to uh, take that same material set and make a flat capacitor out of it. And then more recently, we've gone to a talon capacitor. So the, the cylindrical cap has a, has a big um, a big hole in the middle where you do the wrapping. And because it's, because it's, for those purposes, it needed to be made by high, you know, high speed manufacturing, that whip out, whip out one in two seconds, it had really wide tolerances, big, really big gaps in the device. Um, by cutting up plates instead of wrapping, we could use the same material set, and we could cut about 40% of the volume out that was just dead space before. At the same time, um, we could have a very much more comfortable shape. We could have the thickness we wanted for the device instead of what the capacitor demanded. And we could round the corners so there wouldn't be sharp points where the edge of the device was. And so this is an x-ray of a capacitor showing the cathode inset. The, uh, the craft paper separator doesn't show up quite as well in the, the x-ray, but it sticks out beyond the stack. And there are five plate anode assemblies that uh, are, are the main heart of the capacitor. It's important that you stack this precisely, repeatedly. Uh, for one thing, it determines how much of a gap you need to the case, which is just wasted volume. And for the other thing, you really can't have the cathode nanode touching or it'll short catastrophically. The other thing we need to do since, since we don't have the continuity of the foil all the way through the capacitor, we need to connect the plates. We'd like to do this without taking up any space. And it turns out um, 
that you can, you can just compress locally. Here I'm showing four plates with a tab that we use to connect to the rest of the capacitor. And by just locally compressing the foil, there's a micrograph uh, showing things just coming close together. You, you, you find spaces that the, uh, sort of the needles of oxide there are, are supporting the capacitance for the device um, entangle with each other. And um, it, it's kind of like Velcro. It really sticks together quite well. Um, and it doesn't take very much space. Um, we take the tabs out. We laser weld them. It's important that everything be aluminum. So not very many people laser weld aluminum. We had to learn how. And um, then the last, the last thing we do to figure out how to design the device best is to think how many plates we can have. We can stack up a lot of plates and connect them. But the more capacitance there is in the interior, um, the further the electrolyte has to go through these pores and the more resistance there is. So eventually, the RC time constant of the extra capacitance is too slow to be very useful. Um, we made capacitors of various thicknesses. And you can see the capacitance fall off at about 100 hertz. We can model that with different electrolyte uh, conductivities. We can't actually make any conductivity we want. We're restricted by the chemistry and the, um, uh, the voltage that, that the electrolyte has to support. But you can see that our, in our modeling, right around five um, plates is where we end up. More than that, and it, become, it makes more sense to put it in another cathode. In. Tantalum capacitors have the advantage that you can, you, can make, you can easily make them thicker in the first place. So the resistance as you make them thicker is better because they don't have these torturous pores through the, through the center. Also, the chemistry of tantalum allows you to have an acidic electrolyte, which can be quite a bit more conductive. And so it's possible to make a, a capacitor with just one slug. That also lets you just use the case walls as your cathode. And this ends up being uh, quite, quite nice in energy density. So uh, um, I've told you about defibrillators, defibrillator te technology at Medtronic. And um, over the last 20 years or so, we've improved size and comfort quite a bit. And we've done it by improving the energy density and reliability of our electrolytic capacitors. So thank you again for having me speak here. And thanks for attending. Thanks, Mark.